where his first shot landed was on the door frame of the door. It actually, when it impacted, pushed the door back into Kim. And if he'd have been two inches, three inches more to the right, he would have either hit Kim in the shoulder or he would have shot me in the head. So that's a little closer than I like my incoming fire. I remember making it home, uh, having to leave my boots outside, walk into the utility room to take off my uniform because it was covered, covered in blood. I walked through to the bedroom and I started to take off my vest and the Velcro coming undone woke my wife up. Because I didn't honestly, truly believe that I was, I was drunk. I really didn't. And I got on my way down there to the store. I guess I was weaving pretty good because uh, a citizen called in and said that I was weaving. And when I got to the store, I realized, well, shit, I forgot my wallet. So I was going to drive back home. And uh, I didn't realize it, but uh, police had been waiting on me. And uh, I got out on the street and they pulled me over, said somebody had called in on me. Long story short, I was arrested for DWI. I'm about to go to jail, involuntarily go to jail. That tornado's coming at you. Your life and career and everything is the lone trailer sitting in the field and it's coming right at you. You're listening to the ATO Bridge and Bead Divide podcast. Brought to you by the Assist the Officer Foundation. Since 1999, the ATO has given assistance to the first responder community, and now we want to give them a platform to hear their incredible stories. We also want to hear the stories of the many people that support us. Our community is small, but it is strong. We have differences. We don't always agree, and we all make mistakes. But together we can grow. We can heal and we can learn from those mistakes. And together we can bridge the divide. We never know which lives we influence, or when, or why. Not until the future eats the present, anyways. We know when it's too late. Stephen King. Today's story will be full of emotions, full of elation, promise, sadness, and tragedy. But it also will demonstrate growth and resilience in the beautiful human qualities of adapting and surviving. Today's guest is someone who joined the Dallas Police Department and had visions of serving. And he did. He did at a high level. He knew only survival and success at the Dallas Police Department. We will hear his successes, his addiction to the chase and thrill of accomplishments in doing old-fashioned police work, catching bad guys, helping families. But police work and the toll it can take isn't a fairy tale. Some careers are long and accomplished, and some officers make it out the other side unscathed. Then there are times that life, being in life, shows us exactly how it can change on a dime. This story will demonstrate how fragile life and circumstances can be, and how one mistake, one misstep, can make life turn on a dime. Daniel Jaminson, welcome to the ATL stage. Thanks for having me. It's been a while since I've seen you. Uh, You look great. Um, I'm excited to to get your story out there. um, I think it's going to resonate with a lot of people on a lot of different levels. Uh, You have a lot of friends uh, on this PD, and you have a lot of friends outside the PD. And there's probably a lot about you and your career that a lot of people don't know about. And, you know, we're going to get into that and kind of, Pull back the curtain on you. Looking forward to it. I want to welcome on uh, my co-host, uh, the great Kent Wolverton's here. 
uh, Sergeant Omar Figueroa. He is uh, he's my boss. That's right. <laughs> um, we're gonna start off slow, like always, and we're just gonna we, you know I get, we're gonna get into it. Okay, All let's right. do it. Let's talk about where you grew up. I saw in your bio uh, you didn't you were not born in this country. Tell oh, us about it. I was not. Uh, so my parents met in Austin, and my dad got his PhD in physics and uh, got a job in West Berlin, Germany, doing his postdoc work, uh, and uh, they moved out there. Uh, my mom was a pharmacist, a uh, civilian pharmacist working for the Army uh, out there, and uh, while they were there, they were there for about four years, and while they were there, they had me, and uh, moved back to the States when I was, oh... About a year and a half, two years old, something like that. So he got his PhD. What did what did he do? Like, he was a physicist. Oh wow! Yeah, damn. So he yeah he uh, ended up coming back and getting a job at uh, SMU, teaching physics at SMU, and uh, left there and worked for back many years ago. Um, they were building a particle collider here. Uh, it was going to actually encircle Waxahachie, and he he worked there until the uh, the uh, Funding for that dried up. Man, that's like, that's like some Tony Stark <laughs> shit there. That's that's impressive. Next level intellect. Yeah. yeah. How, and how, how did you get law enforcement <laughs> with, a, with a parents with that kind of medical field? Uh, I don't know. It skips a generation, I guess. I guess. <laughs> so what was home life like for you when you get back to, when you get back to uh, the United States and you're two, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we moved um, to Duncanville. My, my mom... Uh, grew up in Dallas. Um, she went to uh, she went to Kimball. My aunt and uncle, I think, went to Carter. Um, so lots of ties to the Dallas area. Um, my grandparents lived just down the road from the um, uh, I don't know what they call it now. It used to be the the Oak Cliff Country Club right there off of Redbird, just down the way from that. Um, I know what you're talking so, about. Is that Frost Farms? Uh, yeah, I think that's the name of the neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. That, it's very. Channel 7 right yeah. there, yeah. That's a nice neighborhood. <clears throat> it it well, it looks, and the last time I was over there, it looks exactly the same as yeah, it Yeah, it's did. kind of the Kessler Park uh, of that area, Kinda, really. Yeah. 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 My my older brother, he graduated from Carter, and I went to the elementary around there, so I know that yeah. area very well. I think, I, I'm probably going to get this wrong, I'm going to get yelled at by my mom, but uh, I think my uncle was in the first graduating class of Carter. Like, they opened Carter um, uh, while my mom was there, and she had the opportunity to go. She was like, no, nah, I want to graduate with my friends. So she stayed at Kimball. Wow. And, and that's a huge rivalry. Between oh, them yeah. Yeah. Yep. Bitter. Very much so. So you go from from Germany to, to Duncanville, 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 which is totally, it's, it's uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, uh, and it was not to, the beautiful country scenery that no, you have in Germany. No. Uh, I, uh, uh, I grew up there. I mean, I had a, I had a great childhood. Um, you know, my parents obviously big into education. Um, I was, I was decent in school, uh, when I applied myself. Yeah. <laughs> hey, same here. And, uh, uh, ended up, um, uh, all the way through ninth grade going to public school there. And then. In, Which school? Duncanville? Yeah. Duncanville. Okay. Uh, all the way through. Uh, went through the ninth grade school there because they have their separate ninth grade because everything's so there's so many students there. Um, and then they, uh, uh, I had been diagnosed with uh, some learning differences early on, and my parents were able to get me into uh, the Winston School, which is in Dallas, and I ended up graduating from there. That school specializes in kids with learning differences and, and different ways of uh, of adaptive teaching and things like that and uh ended up graduating from there okay at what point did you decide to go the law enforcement route so um i ended up uh going to baylor uh met my wife there um and we moved back after i graduated in 05 moved back to uh to dallas we were living up in North Dallas, and I was working uh, at a, a, a place that builds uh, 
uh, sets for operas and plays and trade shows and, and uh, you know, scenic construction, things like that. And I really was not liking the direction that my life was, was going. I just wasn't happy, um, you know, professionally. Um, and everything was just a struggle. So naturally law enforcement seems like a, like a, uh, a, a, a good move. Um, background on that. Uh, my wife, her dad was a civilian forensic accident reconstructionist and he worked very closely with law enforcement. So, um, we, she had grown up around cops a lot. Um, there were always cops drinking coffee on the back porch. Um, the very first time I ever went and met her folks, the next morning I come, come downstairs and there's, uh, uh, two Texas Rangers <laughs> sitting on the back porch. Uh, don't know that that was an accident, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but, uh. um, so I, I got exposed, uh, after being with her for a few years of, to that world. And I'd always kind of kicked it around, you know, it was always just something that was interesting, but then you start hearing the stories and then you start, start seeing kind of what it, what it's really like. And you're actually talking to the cops and, and listening to them and you're like, okay, this is pretty cool. And I sat her down one day and I said, Hey, Dallas is hiring. Like there's billboards everywhere. There, there's all these hiring bonuses and things like that. Um, what do you think? And she's like, well, the only two things you can't do is be a motor jock and vice. (laughs) And I said, okay. And she's heard the vice stories clearly. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, the police world sounded a lot more appealing than setting up stage yeah. props yes. in, in uh, yes. the opera. Yes. And, but you did have a, a background in uh, theater, right? And I did. And so at, that's what my degree is in. So I was, I was a, a trained actor. Um, uh, and so I was... So you could have gone to Vice. And done well. <laughs> I could have. Yeah, I could have done the UC work. There, uh, there, there might be a picture around there where <laughs> memes were made out of. <laughs> there there might be. I appreciate that. That's your fault, by the way. I know. <laughs> so, shout out to Sergeant Nash. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see that pic, actually. <laughs> I'll send it. Maybe you can post it. No, Lord. <laughs> um, so you're gonna, have to put a, you're gonna have to put a disclaimer on the, <laughs> on the <laughs> podcast. We always do. Don't worry. Uh, uh, so you you just saw Dallas is hiring, which Dallas is always hiring yes. this week because we have a turnover rate here like no other. Yes. Did you have prior to hiring on or applying? Did you have any interactions with Dallas PD uh, outside of getting a ticket? No. Okay. <laughs> just that. Uh, yeah, just that. Um, I I think. Three or four years before I hired on, I'd gotten a ticket by a motor jock, and that's about it. What year did you hire on? Uh, 08. February okay. of 08. And after you graduated, uh, I'm, I don't know, what is it about? September, October? It was October. You go out to uh, Southeast Division? Yep, out to sunny Southeast. Yeah, so when you got out there, what struck you most as far as once you get out? I mean, you're, when you're in training, it's, it's, it's warp speed, but yes. once you got – out and about and kind of learning, learning your way. What it, what struck you most about the actual work there? Um, so I started out on fifth watch and, and so the, it was, that was interesting watching kind of the day progress because it's slow and slow at the beginning of the shift. And then about the time the shift is ending, things are really starting to pick up with the call load and things like that. Um, I, I was struck by like, so my very, very first call was a disturbance that uh, supposedly a group of people, they had baseball bats, they were beating somebody up in the middle of the street. Uh, and we pull up and it, it, I, I kid you not, there's somebody in the front yard of this house and they're doing the hand wave over their head like they did at the academy. I'm like, oh, it really is like this. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really not, but that's just how it, how it worked out. Um, I, I was surprised, honestly, with the pacing. Like it, it was way faster than I expected. And everybody was like, oh, you're going to be so busy. It's southeast. Um, 
it was busier than even I thought it was going to be. And that's coming out of the academy and, and having, you know, uh, people who worked patrol at Southeast coming out and telling me how busy it was going to be. I was just, I was blown away. Just with the call load? Yeah. Just with, I mean, it was, it was, once it picked up right around noon, it just didn't stop. It was constant. And we were always chasing the radio. Yeah, that crime puts its foot on the gas really yeah. early there. And yeah. well, really all divisions now. It, well, and it was it was just the the kinds of calls like just the the craziness and you're like this is on this is supposed to be on TV no this is this is real life it, yeah it's real life and they make shows on it yeah if you actually put it on TV nobody would believe it was real <laughs> like it, it there's just so much going on that you can't fathom like it wouldn't make a good TV show because you couldn't keep up well you would think it's bullshit you know like all oh, this is embellished I remember uh, I, I remember. Th- I was stuck on something. I remember the call coming out that there was uh, a car fire, a vehicle fire and DFR shows up. They put the car out, they open the trunk and there's a body with like three bullet holes in it. The guy's still alive and they're pulling him in. Now it's, it's turning into a thing. And I'm like, I think I saw that in a movie. No, that, that re yeah, I'm sure I did see it in a movie, but it really happened there too. It was like a mafia movie. It really was. Yeah. So you hire out in, in end of 08, you yep. get out, you get out on the streets and you know, I'm looking at your bio here in uh 20, uh, 2009 on mm-hmm. Mesita. Mm-hmm. Tell us about that. So that night, um, we, uh, I was running around with uh, a group of guys, uh, some of the best cops I ever worked with. Um, Better mention your name. So uh, one of them's uh, no longer with the department, John Tut. Uh, he he transitioned out, went to uh, Collin County Sheriff's Office. Uh, Good dude. A- awesome dude. Uh, Greg Valtadoros. Uh, Mike Kroll was one of our buddies that w- we would run around with. And uh, we were out answering calls. We were like a little little pack that went around. We were always covering each other. I mean, that was the culture down there back then anyway. Um, so we were always covering each other. And that night there was, a probably going to get the make wrong, but it was like a white Impala that was running around, uh, committing aggravated robberies. And there was at least two, if not three in Southeast that night that, um, uh, that, that we were like, okay, so they, that, that they're hitting, they're hitting again. We're trying to find them and everybody's on alert waiting to, to find everybody's pulling over white and Paula's. Uh, and then a lot of white and Paula's. Down there's there, a right? lot of white and Paula's. I was like, that's a, it's a, it's a bad day to be driving one of those down there. Um, and so they had done th- two or three aggravated robberies and we're sitting there, uh, talking after a call and everyone gets on the radio and says, uh, mesquites and chase with a white Impala. They just committed an aggravated robbery in mesquite shots fired at the offense and they are coming down. I want to say it was Bruton. And we were at Masters in Bruton. And about the time they said they're coming down, here comes this white Impala through the, the intersection. Sparks, you know, it does 70 right through the red light. And Mesquite's right on them. And we're trying to figure out where, where they are. Air One's trying to call it. And they bail out. And... um so before we, we get into that, I'm going to back up just a little bit on that. Um, that day, one of the, uh, uh, there are chaplains uh, that are DPD chaplains um, that are, uh, are there. I, 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 I assume you all work with them in, yep. In, yep. The, in the unit. Um, so one of the chaplains that day, his name is Mike Middlebrooks. Um, he was, he always wrote out with, uh, uh, Greg and John and uh, that day he decided he was there he wanted to ride out with me and so we were going through all the all the 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 pre-checks telling him kind of how I did things and you know we were gonna hang tight with him too but you know we might get pulled off and uh, he was getting to know me a little bit better and he goes have you been in any shootings and I was like no not yet <laughs> and Wow. About seven and a half hours later, we're on the ground with ag robbery suspects. And one of the guys that ran ends up on the front porch of this house on Mesita uh, that is unrelated to him 
completely. And all of a sudden we find ourselves there and he's got a gun to his head. And uh, we're, we have people up front that are talking to him. It's, hey, man, put the gun down. You know, you don't want to do this. Put this down. Well, he ends up getting on his cell phone and calls his mom. And he's telling his mom on the phone, Mom, I didn't do anything. I don't know. I, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why. You know, I, I didn't know what was going to happen. You know, and I'm sitting there in my mind thinking, why do you have a gun? <laughs> if you didn't do anything, were you just then hauling ass from police? Yeah. Um, and uh, he starts saying things that are not good, like "Tell my kids I love them, Mom, I love you," and he's rotating the gun from his temple to under his chin and he keeps doing that as he's talking and about the time he's done saying mom tell my kids i love them i love you he drops the barrel of the gun and points the gun at the officers there and we end up in a shooting did you shoot i did okay um so suspect goes down was he he was by himself in that car uh no there were other people in that car with him he he was i think he was one of the backseat passengers, I think. Is he the only one? That, everybody else got out and fled, and he's the only one that kind of got barricaded, or how that look? Uh, he... Yes, I think everybody else. Um, <laughs> all the other parts of that are a little bit of a, a blur, but I think he's the only one that got up and got barricaded. Everybody else was taken into custody. Okay. So, walk us through your emotions on that. It was. I remember. I remember the the. The, the gun going off, I remember firing and him dropping, and it was that, that just happened. Like, I just, you know, I really did just get in a shooting. And, um, you know, we, we approached the suspect, um, they rolled him over, and he was um, obviously deceased. And... Then you're you're sitting there, and the standard procedure is you go, and you know they put you by yourself, right? Now there's a criminal investigation, and that you go sit in the car. Well, I go back to my car, and uh, I'm, I'm sitting there with the chaplain, and he goes, "Are you okay?" Because uh, he had heard all the gunfire. He goes, "Are you okay?" I said, "Yeah, I think so." And he goes, "Did you shoot?" I said. Yeah. <laughs> um, you jinxed me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, as uh, being as far removed from it as we are now, I can I can joke about it. But I looked over at him after about 30 seconds of silence. I said, this is your fault. You know that. Yeah. And <laughs> poor uh, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, he he was there, um, you know, trying to be a comfort to all of us. He even you know, he even the, the mom had shown up. She was around the corner on the phone with him. And so he was there with her, uh, trying to be a, a comfort to her. And it, it was, it was, um, looking back on it, I was really lucky to have him there that night just to kind of not be by myself because, you know, at, at the end of the day I was in a shooting and now a guy's dead. Like that's not an easy thing to, to, to sit with by yourself. No. And per the protocol, we usually have like a companion officer. Did you ultimately get a companion officer that, that, uh, chaplain, uh, Miller Brooks stayed with you. Yeah, he he pretty much stayed with me the whole night. And you didn't get another officer, like, uh, I didn't honestly. Yeah, per the protocol, you get one. I didn't actually ask for one because Mike was because he was saying, there with you. Yeah, okay. he was he was there, and I didn't uh, I didn't feel like because he was there that I needed an, another officer. Um, he he did a great job that night. He was he was very calm, very calming. He was a good calming influence on a lot of folks that night. Mike's a good dude. Um, how old were you then when, the, when this happened? Uh, so that was 09. Um, you're making me do math. Uh, I was 27, I think. Okay. So as far as, you know, every every time there's an officer involved shooting, there is a criminal investigation, mm-hmm. and that's, that's standard. Yes. And it ultimately gets presented to the grand jury. And, and so at the time... I can't remember in 09 how it looked, but uh, as far as city, the Dallas Psych Services, how'd that look as far as 
what it looked like as far as taking care of the, and you can be honest, taking care of the officers uh, that were involved in something like that. So that was a first because there were so many officers that had fired um, on that on that deal. Um, and uh, per the protocol, I had to go um, see uh, one of the, the, the city psychs um, before they would let me come back. And I remember I went in, and I don't remember who it was that I saw, um, but I was probably in the office for less than 30 minutes. And uh, I was, you know, it was, he asked how I was feeling about it. I said, you know, I'm, you know, shot somebody. Um, he's a, yeah, he said, well, you know, I mean, he pointed a gun at you. That's n- n- not a lot of responses <laughs> other than that to when somebody points a gun at you. Um and it it took yeah maybe maybe thirty minutes and I was I was out of there. He said, no, "Seem fine." When you were going through like that, there is a there is a checklist of things you have to do before you go back mm-hmm. to the uh, after an officer involved shooting, even going your gun is taken away mm-hmm. and you have to go and get a new gun and qualify. You know, so there's there's a lot of things you have to do to check off a box. Did did that seem like a just another one of these things? Yeah. Okay. It, 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 it was, I mean, obviously they want to, they want to see, cause if you're really struggling with it, there's going to be, you know, they may make recommendations, but if, if you don't seem, you know, I was, I was young, I was still a rookie. I wanted to get back, back to work. So I'm also personally, like I'm, if I start saying I'm struggling with something like they're not going to let me go back to work. And it wasn't the culture either. To no, no, it goes against the culture. Very much so. Very, very much so. So you're encountering a guy that he was processing it himself, and you just sit there and actually watch it going from the from the temple to under his chin back to the temple. Just he is trying to figure out the best way to end his own life, and he ultimately decided the best way at the time that the only thing he could come up with is point the gun at at the police. Yes, yep. suicide by cop. That's exactly what it was. How did that make you feel of of you being put in that position to? It's- carry out his plan it's really frustrating um because it, you know you you don't you don't know if they're really gonna shoot you don't i mean we've we've all heard the stories where a uh, guy comes up and shoots and kills a cop and is waiting for the responding officers for them to kill him just you know uh you you, you just don't know and it's it you feel manipulated um, you feel angry, frustrated, and and sad because you know you I didn't. Take a life. I didn't. I didn't wake up that morning going. Oh, I hope I get in a shooting today. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. Like you go to work every day hoping you don't have to. Nobody wants to get into a shooting. Nobody wants to get in a shooting. They look great on uh, on shows like Lethal Weapon and you know and uh, the old cop shows, but it's they're not fun. Yeah, they're also back to work 12 hours later and yeah. and it's it's not you know the very next day they're like, "Oh, here's here's an extra bullet," you know, and yeah. and it it's it makes it look like like it, cops take it very flippantly when they have to get in a shooting and that's it it doesn't feel that way at all. So, we're going to continue down this path and I want to talk about a little unit called Metro that started up. Can you talk about the, uh, it was chief Brown's, uh, baby and how that just kind of, uh, you know, yeah. came to fruition. So summer of 2012, um, there was a summer crime initiative and they had a violent crime task force that was formed. Um, I got, uh, asked to go over there and, and be part of that. And it was a citywide crime initiative. And, they had done a bunch of these before. This was this was nothing new. This this summer crime initiative. Um, there were a lot of lessons, and they were very interested in asking us. And you were you were part of that that summer one, right? Yeah. Were you there? Yeah, that was. So uh, there was a bunch of us there for that summer one. But I remember them saying uh, v- they were very interested in how what didn't work. Like what we didn't like, what we what we felt we needed, and that was that was new to me because the department didn't typically ask those questions, and so um, I started hearing rumors about some new task force being 
spun up, um, I went back to Northwest Patrol. Um, I think it was end of August, beginning of September. And uh, about November, I get a phone call. It was like, hey, do you want to come join this new task force? Who called you? Do you remember? Uh, I think it was Tom Castro that called me. Tom Castro. Tom Castro called me. Shout out Tom Castro. Shout out to him. Just just retired. retired. Yeah. Yeah, he was a, he was a, that. he was yeah. a class behind me. He he just retired in January. Uh, th- he is he is th- that is definitely a loss to the department. He's he is an awesome dude. Yeah, I would I would have followed that guy into hell. Um, and he, so he calls me, and he was like, "This is going to be a, like a a big, like a big task force, three different shifts, um, and hundred fifty officers." Yep. 150 officers, they were working 10 to 6, 10A to 6P, 6P to 2A, and 8P to 4A. And I got asked to go to the 8P to 4A side. And uh, I, I tell you, I, it, we got there. We had citywide authority. We were chasing crime trends. We were chasing uh, wanted suspects. It's the first time I ever worked a, a, a warrant, you know, from start to finish, just the, pulling the intel, looking looking for a uh, my sergeant, uh, Eric Morales was my sergeant at the time. Um, him shout out to, to him and to Sergeant Nash. They used to be partners. Um, and he, uh, he handed me a warrant and he goes, Hey, can you, uh, Hey, can you, uh, uh, look for this guy? You know, I had, a, I had a detective call me. Um, and, uh, I remember looking for him. And, uh, I don't, I don't know how deep you want me to get into the story on it. It's your story. Um, I remember reading the probable cause affidavit and this guy, he had, uh, aggravated sexual assault of a child and ag assault, deadly weapon, family violence. Um, he had, uh, sexually assaulted the daughter of his girlfriend who was, uh, mentally disabled. And the mom figured it out. She was nonverbal. Uh, the mom figured it out. And when she confronted him, he held a knife to her throat and threatened her and then fled. Um, and the detective, um, I guess, had what he needed, filed the case, uh, filed the warrant. Uh, and I think the warrant had been sitting there for about six months. And uh, Sergeant Morales asked me to look into it. And I remember trying to chase down leads and I didn't, didn't have anything else. So I finally called the mom and, uh, asked her about it. She goes, well, I I think he's supposed to be in California. Uh, that's last I heard. And I hadn't picked up on any of that. Uh, nothing that I had, nothing that I had found indicated he was in California. And, uh, I said, well, the detective will, you know, get a hold of you if he has any questions, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to help. Let me know if there's anything I can, I can do. And she goes, well, I, I'm trying to get just an idea of what's happening. Uh, You're the first officer that's called me. And I was like, uh, now I'm tap dancing. You know, I'm like, I, I I couldn't answer her why it had taken so long for somebody to get a hold of her. Um, and, I, she was very emotional, very upset. Um, but I said, you know, I, I cannot promise outcomes, uh, on this. I can't, I can't promise you what's going to happen, but I can promise you effort and I'm, I'm going to do everything I can to find this guy. And the very, that, so I had talked to her that afternoon. I went into work that night at, at eight and I had exhausted everything. I I didn't know what I was going to do. And I just pulled up one of our databases and I noticed there was a new entry with a new address in Dallas. And at that point you could click on where the information had come from, like why that, why that was there. And it'd come from a moving company. And I went, I haven't seen that. Like that just popped up like three days prior. And we went out there, we had covert units uh, we had covert units set out there and they went, Hey, I think he's here. We went up and knocked on the door and he, uh, he answered 
and we looked at him and he looked at us and <laughs> sergeant looks at him and goes that's him and we grab him and take him into custody and i remember calling sergeant morales and i was like hey we got him and he was ecstatic and i booked him into jail and i remember the next morning uh calling her and saying hey we got him last night and she just broke down and she was sobbing and crying and she goes i was praying that that y'all would find him uh, she goes i know it doesn't it, it probably doesn't seem like much but i'm gonna be able to sleep for the first time in six months tonight that that he's in jail and i mean i remember hanging the phone up and from that moment on i was i was hooked on hunting warrants <laughs> um did you typically get that same feeling when you arrested people or was this one one that you got more invested in i got more invested in this one um it was it was a pretty graphic probable cause affidavit and uh it it became kind of like that one of those white whales that you're looking for and you just can't find them we had plenty of those oh yeah a lot of times especially early on in your career working patrol you'll see somebody or you'll arrest somebody for a warrant, but you don't really know the entire story on it. You know, you get some pretty graphic warrants. Just the title of the offense is sometimes is, is enough to turn your stomach, but to actually understand what's going on, to talk to the victims and then go out and arrest people that it's rare, right? It, not everybody gets an opportunity to be in a unit like that. But then once you do and you realize that, Hey, I can actually help people and I can do some things here, man, that that's one of the, one of the, the big things about this job that makes it worth it. What well, really shows you the intel mining that's behind just just that's beyond the normal going out answering calls and a re, uh, in being reactive to cleaning up somebody else's mess messes. You're still going out and you're having to put building blocks. Your detective builds builds up a case for get probable cause to issue a warrant on a on a suspect, but then they could be in the wind for weeks, months, years, mm -hmm. and. And like you said, this this one little entry from a moving company kind of led you in that direction. And there's that's how it works. You just have to put building blocks, and you have to do a lot of work behind the scenes, and you strike out a lot too. And oh, yeah. and you just have to keep you have to keep going with the bat, keep swinging the bat, and you can, you know, it could work out like this. So the thing about patrol is as rewarding as it can be, and and you know you. You never know what you're going to do that day that 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 you know changes somebody else's life, changes your life. But there's for as different as every day is, there's a lot of repetition, and you can arrest the same people, you can answer calls at the same houses, same disturbance. I mean, it's just there's a lot of repetition, especially in a big, busy urban environment like Dallas, um, and you can get burned out. I know they talk about the five year burnout and all that stuff. Uh, but you, you can get burned out pretty quick. And when I went to Metro, uh, that was kind of the culmination of everything. Every cop kind of wants to do because you're not subject to, you know, going after the, the loud music complaints and the panhandlers and all that stuff. You're focused on, bad guys you're focused on chasing crime trends you're being tasked with going to these areas uh you might be being put in plain clothes to go do covert work to look for specific uh robbery crews uh and uh or look for specific robbery suspects break up robbery crews things like that um and it was it was just every day was fun every day was was even if you were just chasing warrants every day it was you were putting bad guys in jail and they were all violent. They weren't, they weren't, you know, ticket warrants. You weren't cleaning up city ticket files. You were going after violent felony offenders. So, so the, you know, acronym for Metro was measured enforcement, targeting repeat offenders. That's right. And it was such gratifying work, man. I mean, especially the ones where you'd see on their social media, uh, basically issuing us a challenge to catch mm -hmm. them. You can't catch me. Yeah. Oh, challenge accepted. We're, yeah. we're going to get you. Yep. Chuck, yeah. Chuck Young was, 
involved in that, right? He was, yes. Yeah, he he uh, he asked me to go to the Metro unit back whenever it was being started out southeast, but I was pretty embedded with the because mm-hmm. Chief Elsie, I believe, also that was her. Yes, that was her. That was hers. That was her baby, and she mm-hmm. was uh, she was my deputy chief. But yeah, still a picture of her up on the wall in a uh, few did. Yep. No, Tammy Elsie's amazing. I love. That's one of the, my favorite chiefs to work for chuck young's pretty amazing too chuck young shout out chuck young he listens to these uh now victoria pd chief chuck young that, I'll, I'll that's he's, right i forgot about that he's yep. still sticking his head in windows looking for bad guys too oh that guy and let me you know <laughs> i, I want to get him on this show eventually but that's another story altogether Hello. so yeah <laughs> so metro ended up becoming the fugitive unit correct okay and you're you're doing this type of work, and you're seeing the challenges, but also you're seeing the the great use of technology and that you can utilize to find suspects oh, yeah. and to find trends. And it's beyond just being directed by the, you know, soup du jour 6M uh, yes. or fame and disturbance uh, of the day that you have to go multiple times or a random drug house call that, that pops up every other day on, you know, on – uh, Grand Ave, yeah. you know, so it, it, it also can help you develop niches in utilizing these tools. Did you find yourself developing a niche? So I, uh, I ended up uh, falling into helping develop kind of the electronic surveillance side of that, like phone pings, um, doing, uh, uh stuff with, uh, social media, things like that. I became, kind of adept at at doing some of that i got uh to work very closely with some of the, our, our federal partners um shout out to renee uh at uh secret service um shout out, <laughs> shout out to gary mcdonald at the da's office that guy oh he's, we've talked about gary before he he's like a he literally is like a a computer with arms and legs he he, is. he's just the most intelligent people i've ever been around and it was I remember, so this this kind of, you know, the, the phone pings, and, and it, we were always able to do that. Um, a lot of that stayed kind of within the federal task forces. Um, you know, if you needed a phone ping for an emergency, you'd call Fusion. Fusion would, would do all that stuff. It would be U.S. Marshal Task yep. Force would be, Fast Team would be on yep. that. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, I mean, they, they, the, the Marshal Task Force guys, they were the experts. Like, they were, uh, in, in many cases, had written the book on it. Um but I remember we had gotten, we'd kind of fallen in with with Gary being that uh, kind of advisor to us, and man, we we just started, you know, we started looking for these bad guys, and it seemed like every time we would develop this new technique, here'd come this new bad guy that we would be able to try try this new technology on. So we got extremely good. Um, working with not just the DA's office, but our uh, federal partners. Uh, and we, we would, we had, I want to say, Fig, you could probably back me up on this. If we decided to chase you down and we employed these technologies, we had pretty much a 100% capture rate on you. Absolutely. And, that was amazing. And I got, I got very good at, at developing patterns of life. Um, with, I got very good at developing patterns of life, uh, for people looking for me. You would do that. Um, you know, I could historically, um, myself or Renee, we could put you in a building just based on your call history. Uh, it was, uh, it was just insane. And I remember one time the map showed a little dot where the phone was. We pull up into the parking lot, and literally where the dot was, the guy, the bad guy was standing there. Yep, it was amazing. And uh, I mean, it was it was very tight. Uh, I think that one was a. I remember that because I was right behind you guys. We go, we, we're rolling through the parking lot, and all of a sudden, Fig gets on the radio and goes, "There he is!" And he's standing in the middle of the parking lot, right there. Uh, and we ended up surrounding the house, and he almost he said he was going to dive off the the third story balcony. Uh, but he looked over into the field, and there was a canine there, and he said, nah, I better not. <laughs> yeah, he didn't want to uh, jump out of the skillet into the fire. No, canine. no. <laughs> so just even watching you talk about 
this, the uh, the excitement, the you're just kind of reliving oh. euphoria of, of of the success in this job and what it can oh, offer, yeah. and the, how rewarding it feels. But also, there is a lot you have to give mm-hmm. to this job mentally and physically and emotionally because it is a roller coaster. Oh yeah. At that point, did you did how are you dealing with coping as far as dealing with the stress and trauma? Because you put a lot on yourself to go out and find these bad guys. And once you get success, you want more of it. You mm-hmm. want more. And then also it, you actually set your own standard and also bar high. And mm-hmm. if you don't meet that standard and bar, you get down on yourself. Oh yeah. And as I know the feeling, it, 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 it can be very frustrating. Um, how are you dealing with that? Um, it is, it is, so we always called it uh, tactical hide and seek. And uh, I, we loved being hide and seek champs. Um, and you're right, it's very addictive. Uh, because as soon as you get that bad guy, well, now I've got. It's next up. Yep, I got, and, and you're not just getting that there. We, we were assigned warrants, but we also got to pick our own warrants. So. We were, we were very, um, we, it, we were very selective in, 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 in some cases, um, we developed close relationships and there were plenty of times where we were brought in almost at the beginning. Um, you know, um, we would sometimes work these cases with the f- case filing detectives and you're just, you're talking to the. Uh, you're talking to the victims. Sometimes you're talking to witnesses and it does, it starts to starts to wear on you because you start to, to feel like you're a part of, of this story and it gets, you're always putting pressure on yourself. I was always my own worst critic. Um, you know, I got to get this guy. I got to get this guy. I got to get this guy. And you're, my wife always said that that I had FOMO, you know, taking days off work. Um, you know, I'd be that's fear of missing out. Yes, sorry. <laughs> uh, you know, if I took a day off work, um, and and we had, you know, the 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 city phone apps would start going off. I'd be getting in text threads, and I'd be checking it. And she's like, you know, you're here, you know, be here, you know, you're you're supposed to be on a day off. And you get so invested and you get so, um, you get so, no, well, invested, I guess is the, is the best word for it, that, that you, you can't stand not being a part of it. And I, I had a real struggle with letting work be at work. It didn't start out that way, but you know, the, the more you're into it, you know, oh, my guys are running this big warrant today. You know, uh, uh, you know, I, it's not that I didn't want to be at home, but I didn't want to miss out. It's intoxicating. It is. It's, it, it is. It is very intoxicating, very addictive. And and on top of that, there's there's that that nagging voice in the back of your head that, OK, so they're going to run this big warrant today. What if something goes wrong? What if something happens to one of my guys and I'm not there like that is that is the, the gut punch that that you know you don't want to think about but you know it's also it's hard uh and this is a great example of of uh officer daniel jameson as opposed to being daddy Mm -hmm. jameson or husband jameson right yeah it's really hard to flip that switch and and straddle that fence to to pour into both sides. Well, you know, that's one of the things about being a cop, uh, first responder in general too, but I think cop especially is, you know, what do you, what do you do for a living? Um, um, I work in insurance. What do you do? You know, I, I'm, I, I do accounting work for this company. What do you do for a living? I'm a cop. I, I mean, that's, that's what you are. And unfortunately you don't get the, you know, as cops, we don't turn that, off when we get to the house when we get to uh 
the restaurant when you're always sitting with your back, you know, you, you have to face the door, you, you have to sit in the back of the restaurant, you know, yeah, that's kind of cliched to, to say those things, but it's very real. It's very real. Yeah. Hyper vigilance is, it's all too real. And it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't start out that way, especially as a rookie, but when you've gone through enough things, you start to develop kind of that, the hair on the back of your neck starts to tell you, Hey, something, something's not right. Even if you can't tell what it is. Um, and it constantly being switched on. Well, you develop in intuitive traits, mm -hmm. just like you develop skill, skill sets to hunt. Yep. Right. And it, it's, it's hard to, and, and like I said, you know, success is intoxicating success is it makes you thirsty for more mm -hmm. and it's hard to it's hard to think about anything but that because i'm sure there was a lot of times when you're off work and you're with the family and you get a call from somebody that you work with you you know it was that fomo it was yeah. the fear of missing out and it's hard to give all to the family when you really are concerned about your team the next lead on the warrant. Yep. Right. And on top of that, you know, you're, you know, as a, as a detective, you know, yes, you're off, but you're not, you're not off. And so when, you know, DPD being so big, I, I'm sure it's this way at smaller departments too, but especially at DPD, you know, the homicide detectives had no idea that I was off that day. It's not, there's not a, an email chain that goes out. So I'd be, I'd be, you know, at, lunch with my family and I get a homicide detective call my city phone uh, because even when you're off you're carrying your city phone around um, because you never know what's going to happen you may have to come in and which happened plenty of times which happened plenty of times and so now you're when you're supposed to be with your family you're talking about a homicide that happened five hours ago and well I'm not at work today how about you call fig and uh, he, I know he's at work um, you know and then there's the thing of they're about to run a homicide warrant. You got the call, but you're at home. Now Fig's going to go run the homicide warrant, and there's that FOMO. And it's, it's, it's frustrating because, you know, as, as a dad, as a husband, I, you know, in your, in your head, you're wanting to be there. And it's just, it's like that elastic rubber band constantly pulling you back, and you're fighting against, uh, fighting against it. And uh, it, it gets... Not just frustrating for, for me, but for you know my wife, <laughs> for my kids. You know, Daddy, do you have to go to work? Unfortunately, yes. You know, I want to get into a date that's that's really just it's always going to haunt this city. Mm -hmm. July seventh, twenty sixteen. Mm -hmm. Can you walk us through uh, your your day from your perspective? So that was a really interesting time uh, in in the, the country for the narrative. I mean, that was we had Ferguson, we had uh, the Philando Castile shooting, uh, and there was protests all the time. I, I I don't remember what the frequency was in Dallas, but it was certainly probably two or three a week. Um, police brutality uh, protests. Um, I'm sure you know that better than better than anybody. Um, but we were, you know, as as uh, Metro because we were we were still Metro at the specialized time. Specialized unit, a specialized unit. There, we were. I don't want to say we were at every protest, but we were at a lot of them. And we we're always on standby. Yeah, for we sure. were always on standby. And oddly enough, the night before, um, my wife had been texting back and forth through social media with some people that we knew. Um, and they were having kind of a heated, heated conversation, heated argument. Um, nobody was listening to anybody. She was trying to get her point across about how dangerous things were and how she was worried about me. And uh, it just wasn't, wasn't going well. And I was like, just stop. Um, and she was, she was so frustrated and she was scared. Um, and that night she was like, I, I know something bad is going to happen. I can just feel it. And I was like, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, you know, 
we get to work that day and it was just just a day i mean we were out doing what we normally did um we were up in northeast covering some guys uh he uh one of my partners um arrested uh some gangbangers and my partner i was riding with that day um zach he uh he and i took the guns that we found in the car and we said hey we'll take them to the uh, property room book them in for you don't worry about it and while we were kind of heading that way to the property room i'm messaging with a friend of mine and she sends me a message she goes i want to go to the protest tonight but i'm i'm kind of scared and i said what protest and she says well there's a there's a protest tonight and uh, you know she was afraid that that either the police were going to overreact or something bad was going to happen and there had been plenty of cnn you know fox news stories just you building could, it up yep and you could see that you know the protests were getting kind of violent and she was very afraid that um you know something was going to happen and i said hey Dallas has, a, you know, for all of our faults, Dallas has a pretty good reputation about handling business. You know, you shouldn't worry about anything like that. You know, you'll be fine. I still have those messages. Um, my partner and I get to the property room and uh, we're doing what you do at the property room. We're, we're seeing, co- you know, buddies we haven't seen in, you know, weeks or months. We're BSing with people there. Um, and we are there with some channel one officers that we didn't know. They just happened to have their radio on and you hear the tone come out and they say, I need elements at uh, market and Lamar. We have shots fired officer down and we look up and the Lieutenant is who's there at the property room. Just looks at us and goes, go, just go. And you know, we're that day, Zach is driving that day. I I don't know how he threaded the needle, but he was probably doing 70, 80 miles an hour down Elm street heading that way. And we had switched the radio to channel one and it was just chaos. Um, you know, uh, we, you were there. Uh, I mean, it, I, I can't, uh, I can't describe, you know, we were hearing reports of snipers, um, multiple shooters, multiple shooters, garages and, and they just didn't know. And we were hearing calls about more officers going down. And I remember thinking like, it, it, it's not, it can't be what I'm hearing on the radio. And we pull up to um, Elman Lamar and Zach stops and he's, he's hollering. He's like, which way do we go? Left or straight, you know, left or straight, left or straight, which way? And I go, go left. I'm looking. And as soon as we pull the car around the corner, there's officers laying in the middle of the street. And both of us at the same time just go, Oh my God. Um, And we pull up right there in front of, um, what turned out to be the suspect car, um, and bailed out. And, uh, Zach goes to one of the downed officers and I laser in on another, um, another group of officers trying to load, uh, an officer into the back of a squad, uh, back of a squad car. And I jump in and I'm starting to try to pull him in. And I think at one point I'm like, Hey, help me out because I didn't realize you know, that he couldn't. Um, and we're working to get him in. And finally I grab him by where his vest is and I pull him in and I fall back and I, his head lands in my lap. And I look down and I go, Oh shit, I know him. And it was Patrick Zamaripa. And I look down at him and the doors start to close. And uh, I can't remember his name. Now, uh, Sergeant jumps in the front seat and starts to try to drive off. And I look down at Patrick and 
he was gone. Um, now, looking back, he was gone. Um, at the time, I was, I started doing CPR. I started talking to him um, and just, you know, saying, please don't die. Please don't die on me. Um, you know, talking to him. Um, and we made it from where we were to the ER at Parkland. It's a long time when you're doing CPR. Um, seemed, seemed like a lot longer, but uh, less than five minutes. I mean, he drove the wheels off that car, getting us up there. Um, I, I know we were doing probably 100, 115 miles an hour, northbound 35. Um, certainly over 100, 115 easy. And um, I remember pulling into the ambulance bay and just screaming, like, hey, you know, we need, you know, get somebody out here. Um, and they were, they were as surprised that we were there as, as we were to be there. Um, but that, that, it was like ants coming out of an anthill. The way people came out of there, they grabbed him and put him on a stretcher and uh, wheeled him in. And uh, I was, I was, standing there just in shock like I, I didn't know what to do um and then more officers came in and they didn't stop and some were wounded and I remember seeing uh them wheel an officer past and I said who's that and uh one of my buddies uh Bo McCluskey uh who works for McKinney PD now was there and he said, it's Mike Kroll. And uh, I, uh, I pretty much lost it there. Um, I watched them call Patrick, and I watched them call Mike. And uh, I remember uh, <laughs> I remember that night, um, I reached down to try to call my wife, and I went, where's my cell phone? I'd left my cell phone at the property room when we ran out. And I was at the uh, nurse's station. I said, I need, a, I need a phone. Do y'all have a phone? And they were like, use that one. And I called my wife's number knowing that she's probably not going to answer when she doesn't recognize the number. So I called her again and again and again. And it dawned on me about the fourth time I called her that her caller ID app was probably registering Parkland Hospital. And she answered the phone and, uh, you know, I, I said, it, it, it's not me, I'm not hurt. And she said, what are you talking about? She hadn't turned the news on yet. She didn't, she didn't know. And uh, I told her and she, she kept asking, you know, you're, you're at the hospital, are you sure you're not shot? And I said, I'm, I'm sure I'm not shot. And... Um, I remember being on the phone with her and I couldn't, I couldn't figure out it's the weird thing that your brain focuses in on. Um, I was like, there is something wrong with my pants. Like what is going on? I kept kicking like my, the cuff of my pants kept getting stuck in my boots. I'm like, what is going on? And I'm on the phone with my wife and I reach down to adjust my pants and I pull back and they're completely soaked with blood. I didn't even know that. Um, from probably about my knees were just completely soaked. And I was just standing there on the phone with my wife and looking at my hand that was covered in blood. And she was like, you know, what are you, what are you going to do? Um, I said, I don't know. I, I, I'm here. We don't know what's going on. At the time, we thought it was multiple shooters. I said, I don't know where Zach is. Zach was loading, um, actually, he loaded Mike into a squad car, and uh, he got transported. He loaded him into our squad car, actually. And um, it, it, I thought Zach was, was coming, and he wasn't there. And Zach was, my partner was still out in the field, and I was, you know, just, just there. Um, and I had to go do a... Um, uh, I guess, what do you call it? I give a statement at SIU. Um, 
you know, Capers was just yeah, it, they're overwhelmed. It, it was, it was, it was, I've never seen anything like that before or since. Um, and I remember, uh, it was Casey Shelton who, uh, took my statement and the Lieutenant who was there, um, you know, told me, he was like, well, you know, after I, after I'd given my statement and done all that, he was like, okay, go home. And I was like, my, my guys are still out there. Like I started to walk to my car and I, I called Nash. Um, Nash was off that day and came in and I, I called him and I said, where are you? Uh, and he sent somebody to come pick me up. And, uh, we went down there and I, I found Zach John Tut was down there. He was working an off-duty job and responded. Um, I got to tell him about uh, Mikey. And uh, he he took that about as well as you could expect. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, we were there. I, I, I don't. I don't know how long we were there. I mean, it was. It, it, it was a few more hours, and we were just uh, the longest night of my career, yeah. of all of our careers. Yeah. I didn't even know where you guys were. Uh, I, I I had no idea what y'all had done with Brent. Um. You know that was. Uh, that was very. Um, I don't know, numbing, like you're, I mean, so much is happening. Like your brain just goes into survival mode and you're putting one foot in front of the other. Um, you know, we were very, uh, concerned, uh, at least those of us that were down there. I mean, I, you know, I'd been to the hospital. I hadn't gotten, the radios weren't working inside the ER. I didn't know probably half of what everybody else out there knew. But to me, you know, there, there's still more shooters out there, right? Like, we don't know. Um, the Seven Eleven's getting looted. That's where we were standing. Um, uh, that was a very antagonistic crowd. Um, we were worried about something starting up there. Um, and I remember the radio coming, coming alive, and they say, hey, something's about to happen. Just everybody just be prepared for, you know, n- nobody shoot into the building. Uh and uh, we were we were waiting, and all of a sudden we hear this boom. And I went, "That's not a flashbang." I don't know what that is, but that was not a flashbang. And um, uh, a few minutes later, they 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 called it the area secure, um, and we got relieved to go home. And uh, I remember just driving home, and. You know, hands at hands at nine and three, just driving, not a n- no sound, no nothing, and just kind of in shock. Um, and I remember uh, making it home and uh, having to leave my boots outside and uh, walk into the utility room to take off my uniform because it was covered, um, covered in blood. And, uh, I walked through to the bedroom and I started to take off my vest and the Velcro coming undone, woke my wife up. And that was, she got up and she hugged me and, uh, I've been with her now, uh, 21 years and, She's never hugged me like that before or since. Um, and, uh, you know, she was saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad. I'm so sorry, but I'm so glad. Um, and uh, she, I guess, hadn't really been sleeping. She finally went to sleep, and I went and sat in the living room in the dark. And I remember just sitting there breaking down crying. I, I, I didn't know what else to do. Um, and probably about 
four in the morning, five in the morning. I finally went to bed and uh, got up the next day. Had to be at work at three. Daniel, you got to go back to work at three o'clock on seven, eight. How'd that feel? Um, surreal. Um, not going to lie. I was a little scared. Um, but I remember getting up, um, having coffee. Obviously I slept in a little bit. Um, and my wife, uh, comes in and sees me getting dressed and starts tearing up and she comes over and uh, by this point I think I've got everything but the gun belt on and she hugs me and starts crying and she starts begging she please don't go please please don't go please stay here and I remember just saying I, I have to like I, I I couldn't not go um there was a lot um, there was a lot of things that were said uh, about the days after seven seven one of the things chief Brown said at the time was that um, everybody showed up to work on seven eight I don't think that was an exaggeration. I think everybody showed up on seven eight and I remember coming in we were kind of like zombies um and we sat down and chuck young uh shout out to chuck was there um what do you say i mean what do you tell your troops after something like that um i mean the full weight of everything still hadn't kind of leveled out yet uh we were still processing I mean, that scene was processed for, what, five days? Something like that? We still we still didn't have the whole story. Um, and he... I don't even remember exactly what he said. I remember it being... We were all in the days, man. Yeah. I mean, it's... Everything's a blur. But um, they had us go and provide um, kind of security at the Southwest substation. Um, They had lost the most guys. And, um, you know, we were there doing that so that they could, you know, the the patrol guys down there could could be... uh, Mourn. Yeah, be able to mourn and be there for each other. Um, And so on the 8th, we were doing... We were doing security there. Um, And then... Uh, on the ninth, um, they had, uh, we came in and I remember, oh, was it chief Humphrey came in and asked who all has heavy vests and, and helmets. And we were looking at each other like some of us do not, not everybody. And, uh, that was the day headquarters got locked down because they had a, uh, uh, confirmed threat on on headquarters and reports of someone in the garage yep i I was i was there we were we were were clearing the garages yep um and then uh yeah how are you taking care of yourself i mean looking back now and and you've got you've got several years to you know revisit that and look at how you were going with all we there's some critical incidents we haven't even talked about and then you yep. were, we're on set. We're just leaving seven seven right now. Yeah. Looking back, how are you taking care of yourself from a emotional, mental, physical standpoint? I was just pushing through. Um, I was uh, probably not too long after that uh, started drinking uh, more. I mean, I, I I always drank, but more i think 
after yeah. seven seven not immediately after um but it, as it, the common analogy is the frog in the boiling pot of water um i think probably seven seven was the spark that lit the gas underneath it um it, it didn't start the it didn't start the water boiling it just turned the heat on um and you know that was just i remember a lot of times um just being like wanting to be there wanting to be present in whatever it was i was doing and there were times i was just in a fog um i watched uh uh oh it's been a few weeks now but uh, american sniper there's a scene in that movie where um Bradley Cooper's playing Chris Kyle and he's back from deployment and he's got kids and his kids are playing and I can't remember. He may or may not have a beer in his hand. I don't remember what it is, Um, but he's sitting there and the camera pans around and he's just sitting in his chair, just staring and the TV starts to come into view and he's just staring at the TV. The TV's turned off. He's just staring and I saw that and I was like, man that's that's a little too real um you know um it, it wasn't all the time but there were times when i would just be not there did a drink it help well that's the sinister thing about alcohol is you know, it it works um until it doesn't um <laughs> uh, but it 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 did a little um you know, as much of it as was habit, you know, I'd get home and have a drink, have a beer. Um, it, uh, uh, it was, um, it became an effective habit, um, at, at, at certain points. Um, you know, and at that point I wasn't, I wasn't drinking a lot. It just, it was. How was it effective? What, what was it that you were looking for? there came a point where and I don't know how else to describe this but you, your brain gets really loud uh, n- not like hearing voices or anything like that but it's just it, it, it's, it's the thoughts yeah it's it's just loud and you can't turn it off and it works to kind of quiet some of that down um, and you know you're stressed and you're just amped and just you start to um i mean it 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 works it de-stresses you some and numbs you yeah and sometimes that's what you're sometimes it's not that you don't feel anything it's that you feel too much and you just it's not that you don't want to feel it is that you don't want to feel it as intensely as you are like the in like the euphoria and the success of the job Mm -hmm. the other side of the job that could lead to other addictions yeah and you're wanting that feeling of being numb because it helps with the pain Mm -hmm. we're moving on through this timeline because we are building up to yes folks a another critical incident this man's career we're going to take you back to February 2021. Big T Bazaar. Can mm-hmm. you tell us about that? So we had been tasked with uh, locating this um, particularly violent uh, gang member. And he he had uh, he pulled out a, a revolver and an AK-47 on somebody, threatened to kill him. Um, and when you pulled up this guy's history, he was, he was one of those one percent, one percenters. He was a, a, a legitimately bad dude. And we, uh, we located his house. Um, they were going to want to run search warrants on it. It was, it was turning into a big deal and SWAT was going to hit the house. Um, then a baby comes out, then a baby comes out. And puts puts the brakes on on that. I mean, SWAT's not gonna 
SWAT's not going to hit the house, gas it, do all that stuff with a baby in there. That was a, that was a, a no go. And we all knew it. Um, so we all got up early the next morning. We had covert sitting all night watching it in case they could get him. Um, we come in early the next morning, stage up. Um, and he ends up getting mobile in a car. We're following him and he drives out to the big T bazaar and we get, um, we get an opportunity to do uh, what we, we call the high risk apprehension, um, on him. Can you describe that real quick for the listener that may not know what that is? So HRAs, um, we would be in a, uh, smooth covert car, uh, an SUV and we would, we were all typically in plain clothes, but we would mark up and have markings. We would have heavy vests. We were very clearly police when we jumped out and we would, uh, if you were on a vehicle or in this case, he was a pedestrian, uh, we would pull up alongside and jump out, uh, identify ourselves and, uh, take him into custody. Uh, and that was not a, it, it, it wasn't an uncommon practice, but we didn't do it for just anybody like you, you know, just because you had a, a felony warrant doesn't mean you were getting an HRA on you. It had to be, you a had special to, kind of piece yes. of shit. You had to be, you had to be likely armed, um, and intent on resisting or fleeing. And, um, we knew him to be armed, um, that it was very likely he was going to be, he was always the intelligence we had. He, he always had guns, um, and not just guns, but long guns. So we, um, we gear up and set up for, for this, um, HRA and he comes walking out of this store and as we're pulling up, um, he kind of looks at the car as it's coming and he, he ended up transitioning his hand to his coat pocket and, uh, he, as we pull alongside the doors start to come open um, I'm in the, um, seat three, seat three. So seat three is the rear uh, driver's side. So I'm sitting right behind the driver and my job in that HRA is to be support. So on the passenger side, seat two was fig. Uh, and my partner Kim Howard was in uh, seat four right behind him and driver and driver was Dan Russell, who you may or may not know. I know him a little. <laughs> um, so we're all uh, we're all in the car, and as my door's coming open and my foot's coming out, I hear a pop, and I know they're shouting Dallas Police. And you hear a pop, and I went, "That's not a rifle." We all had rifles, and by the time I get around to that side of the car. Um, yeah, I, I didn't see what happened, um, initially, uh, but he was on the ground and I had heard rifle fire going off as I'm coming around the car. And it turns out it was fig returning fire. Um, the guy had shot at us and, uh, we ended up getting him into custody. Um, fig showed tremendous restraint in that situation. Um, and the guy survived the encounter. Um, he flipped over the, he did. the car and he matrixed did. my shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he almost didn't make it, uh, out of that. But, um, as things were calming down, I looked over and there is a very distinct divot in the car door. Um, and he, where his first shot landed was on the door frame of the door. And it actually, when it impacted, pushed the door back into Kim. And if he'd have been, what do you say, Fig, two inches, three inches, more to the right, Mm -hmm. um, he would have either hit Kim in the shoulder or he would have shot me in the head where where I was. Um, So that's a little closer than I like my incoming fire. Um, And... That was, again, it was one of those um, one of those pucker factor moments where you realize that, that that could have been a really bad day really quick. 
you've had a lot of pucker factors going back to 2009 on Masita. Mm-hmm. And then here we are in February 2021 at the POS Bruton Big T or the Big T Bazaar. Mm-hmm. And you going back to 7 7, you watch five, other, five fellow officers uh, lose their life and also several others injured. Mm-hmm. And then 2021, it was that close. You know, it could have was that close where you almost lost your life. I've talked before about this job being like, concrete pouring on your shoulders mm-hmm, mm-hmm. every year and mm-hmm. it just gets heavier and heavier and you talked about the escalation and drinking mm-hmm. to cope and also to numb mm-hmm. and that is a horrible side effect of of trauma and mm-hmm. trying to cope with trauma and you've literally had a lifetime of it in this profession at that point in 2021, how were you, and after going through this shooting, what did it look like for you then as far as, again, I'm going back to caring for yourself, and and I want to talk about where you were as far as what coping mechanisms were you using at that point? So I was trying to immerse myself in being there for my kids, being at home, um, hindsight being what it is, I wasn't doing a very good job of it. Um, the desire to do that, the desire to be present at home was incredibly strong. Um, but at the time, you don't know what you don't know, right? And so because you don't know what you don't know, I didn't. Um, I didn't understand what the uh, symptoms to, I didn't understand what symptoms to look for. Right. I I didn't understand that it being, it taking an act of Congress for me to want to go mow the lawn, you know, or just not being able to sleep and, and not, and you know, Everybody in this job, everybody in this job has the nightmares. You know, the standard one of you firing your gun and the bullets bouncing off the bad guy, stuff like that. I mean, everybody has the trigger won't pull. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was just... It was probably not too long after that that I started to kind of think something's not right. Like, again, the frog in the boiling pot of water. doesn't know the water's boiling till it's too late. The water may not have been boiling yet, but it was it was hot. Um, and I just it, it it wasn't that there was an increase in drinking; it just kept going. And again, it's a really poor coping mechanism because you know when you're trying to do that because you can't sleep. Well, it screws up your sleep even worse. All of this stuff becomes the snake eating its own tail. And I remember one of the things that, that stuck with me um, prior to all this, I was, my wife and I were watching TV. We were in the living room and we were watching a comedy special. I forget who it was, but they said something funny and I, and I laughed. Like I, was, I remember going, Oh, that's hysterical. And my wife's looking at me. She goes, what? And I said, I'm looking at her confused. Like, what are you talking about? She goes, that was funny. I said, I laughed. She goes, no, you didn't. She goes, you, you never laugh anymore. And I was like, ouch. <laughs> uh, you know. Void of emotion. Y- yeah. yeah. And it was, it was that, I, you know, I thought it was funny. To me, I laughed. But to the outside world with what she was seeing, I was not laughing. Um, And it was, that was kind of the beginning of me going, because she started saying, you know, you know, laugh, you know, at one point I came in or she came into the, to the room and she goes, where are you? Um, Here? No, you're not. 
and I, <laughs> as in many things in my life, it's taken my wife putting her foot in my backside to get me to, to, to realize something. And about that time I, I started, um, thinking well, maybe I have depression. And I said that to my wife one day and she goes, fucking duh. I'm like, oh. Okay, ouch again. And at that time, on the department, it, it still wasn't widely talked about, and, and oh, there no. wasn't there wasn't a lot of education yeah. on 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 that subject. Nothing outside of the box check at core. You know, you would go, and it, it's not that the people that came in didn't care about it, but it's a two hour block, maybe an hour at core because they need to fill it, or maybe T Cole requires it. You, you know, it, it's it's not. It's not that, and I'm sure the people that came in that wanted to talk about it probably would have loved to have had a whole day or a week or, you know, to do real classes. But it was just another class. It was just another class. And, and on top of that, you know, I mean, we're cops, we're type A personalities. You know, you would, you would sit there and listen to them talk about, um, uh, you know, situations with other first responders from not, not at DPD, but other agencies. And you'd be like, well, I'm glad none of that's happening to me. But you're that frog in that bowl of water. Mm -hmm. And because for those people, the water already boiled. And, you know, things have already happened to them. It hasn't happened to, to me yet. So, um, good thing I'm not that guy. Or Daniel, speaking of that bowl of water, and you're in it and you don't realize it. Mm -hmm. I want to take you back to May 25th. 2022 when it it hit a bowling point mm-hmm. um so that was uh, uh memorial day weekend um and we had gotten uh, invited to go to a memorial day party and um got there everybody was having a good time kids were having a good time and uh we ended up you know doing what you do on memorial day which is be out by the pool drinking um drinking like i i I did on my day off um and uh the party was at a, a country club and there was like a defined beginning and end to it, right? Um, and so we were, we were there, um, party wound down, and we were going to have some friends come back to our house. And um, I'd been drinking uh, a fair amount. And uh, when we went home, my wife was like, "You, you don't, you don't need to be driving." Um, so she drove home uh, with us there. We get there, and uh, I realized that we didn't have what I, I wanted, and so I decided that I was going to go run, run, run around the corner to the store, uh, get what we needed, and um, my wife was like, are you good? Like, are you good to drive? And I said, no, I'm, I'm fine, because um, I didn't honestly, truly believe that I was, I was drunk. I, I, I really didn't. Um, and I got on my way down there to the store. Um, I guess I was weaving pretty good, uh, cause a citizen called in and said that I was weaving. Um, and when I got to the store, I realized, well, shit, I forgot my wallet. I'd left it in the, um, the beach bag. Um, you know, I didn't have it with me, so I'd forgotten to pull it out. So I was going to drive back home. And, uh, I didn't realize it, but, uh, police had been waiting on me and, uh, I got out on the street and they pulled me over and they, um, said somebody had called in on me. Um, long story short, I was arrested for DWI. Going back to them pulling you over, mm-hmm. did did that fear, instant fear, just hit? And I, did you realize that you? I knew what time it was. I mean, it was it was. Um, 
you know, when you're a cop, you know what it's like when the cop car's behind you, it's about to pull you over because you've been in that cop car so many times. Bumper lock yep. you and mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was not like, oh, you know, oh, there's a police car behind me. Like, I could tell. Um, I got pulled over and, um, you know, it was, I knew what, I mean, I, I knew what was going to happen. Um, what was going through your mind? Oh, I, I'm done. Like, this is the end of my career. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm about to go to jail, involuntarily go to jail. Um, not used to that. Um, you know, the, just the, the tornado of, you know, the life that you have. It, I mean, that tornado is coming at you there and your life and career and everything is the lone trailer sitting in the field and it's coming right at you. And that's exactly what happened. Um, it just, it just hit it and vaporized it. Everything was gone. Did you realize that you were that drunk though? Whenever the cuffs went on? No. Um, Looking back, I was probably more, I was getting drunker, right? Like I hadn't, like. Hadn't peaked yet. Yeah. You're on your way up. Yep. Um, So, you know, I'd get arrested. They go down, get a blood draw warrant, and uh, book me in the Collin County Jail, which is about as much fun as you can imagine it being. Um, Being on the other end. Yeah, of that and and there's so many unknowns. Oh yeah, with everything. Um, I mean, you know, you 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 give. You know, you always hear the advice. You always give advice. You're, but when it's happening to you, like, you know, uh, I mean, the entire time, I, I just kept thinking like, this is a, this has to be a dream. Like this, like this is not. This isn't real. This isn't happening. You know. Um. I remember, you know, being asleep in, like, the little cell area that they had me in. I was by myself, and I remember being asleep, and I woke up two or three times, and every time I woke up, I thought, oh, thank God, it's, I'm here, and then my eyes would open, and I'd realize I'm still there. Um, That, while 7-7 was the longest night of my professional life, that was the longest night of my life. Um, You know, just realizing... You know, I mean, I knew everything was over at that point. I mean, 15 years almost, 14 and a half or so at that point, something like that. Um, Just gone. By just a night of. Mm -hmm. And, and, And the thing is that, you know, like I didn't do that. Right. The, you know, looking back, that that wasn't that wasn't something I did. I mean, you know, we didn't go out and drink. Uh, most of it, it, it was too expensive to go out to drink. Why not just stay at home? You know, I mean, it's it it's safer. It's easier. You know, I don't have to worry about wearing pants. <laughs> you know, I yeah. can do what I. You know, you're you're at home. Um, but it was it took a while for me to start to understand why my brain said no no you're good you're good it's, it's fine it, it's fine what was that <sighs> again getting back to not knowing what you don't know um and after going through and 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 realizing that i had uh, getting diagnosed with PTS and all that, uh, the your brain needing that stimulation and the risk taking and just being being reckless about things. Um, you know, when you get motivated to do something, you're not doing things the right way. Um, and it's just, it, and your brain just skips over those steps. 
and the 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 speed bumps that get that you put build yourself you know i'm i'm not going to do this this isn't okay you know this is a hard line they start to get smaller start to get torn down and you know you're you're doing things you know uh, you know and, and thank god thank god that, that i didn't run into anybody that night thank god i didn't hurt anybody um because i could have I, I mean i i got very for as unlucky as 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 i was i got very lucky that night um you know it was the stupidest decision i could have ever made I mean, hands down i don't i can't imagine a stupider decision to make and cost me so these deals have ramifications past just you right, right. It, oh, yeah. i mean as a father mm -hmm. as a husband how do you think that affected the rest of your family um my wife, God bless her, I, I, I say, uh, you know, despite my best effort, she refuses to leave me. Um, you know, she, she knew something was wrong. Again, she didn't know what. Um, but she was basically, you know, all right, we're going to get through this. Like, we're going we're gonna, to, you know, what's the next step? Um, she's always been my biggest supporter, uh, my cheerleader, even when I didn't deserve it. Uh, but you know, for me, it was, you know, my kids, um, my son is just, he was, you know, daddy being a police officer, holy crap. Like that was everything. He, if I brought home you know, our take home cars or whatever with the lights, he would, I have pictures of him sitting in my garage, just sitting in the car with the lights on. And, and he would just sit in there and, you know, want to watch his phone or play a game or something, just sit in the squad car, not squad car, but the take home car with the lights in it. Um, and if I happen to bring a squad car home, oh, and to see the look on his face when he finally realized that daddy wasn't going to be a police anymore, that was fucking hard. Um, you know, they were, they were young, so they didn't quite understand it. My oldest was old enough to understand what happened. That sucked. Um, you know, I, you know, they've, they've had to watch me go through all of this. Um, and you know, it, it's been not just emotionally, you know, hard on them. Um, but you know, you lose a good steady job, things get thing, you know, they want to do things and we can't do it now. Um, and it just, you know, they're the ones, you know, it, for me, I understand why I have to go through it. Like I get that. I, I spent, you know, for me, I spent an entire career holding people accountable. I what kind of an example am I to my kids if I don't hold myself accountable? But, you know, what sucked the most was knowing that they were going to suffer too and they didn't deserve it because of my dumbass decisions. Um, that's one of the hardest things that I, one of the hardest things that I, I, I've, continually had to deal with on this is just you know people that and, and my wife too you know everybody suffered because of that when it's also going into like heroes have flaws and heroes have weaknesses yeah. you're their hero yeah and you know it sucks to watch your you know <laughs> what do they say don't meet your heroes um it it, uh, you know, my, my son still, uh, well, well, you know, he still asks, you know, will you, you know, are you ever going to be a police officer again? And I'm like, 
<laughs> no, <laughs> sorry. Um, but, uh, you know, he's, he's still, he still talks about, you know, that's still, you know, my daddy was a police officer and that was, yeah. Yeah. Your biggest, you know, this whole thing from this incident in 2022, there's an unfolding of a process. Oh yeah. And, you know, we see it for other people that we, we've actually put in, in jail mm-hmm. and gone in prepared prepared for court with and you would hope uh that some of them more than likely they had their own support group who were your who was your support group whenever you're when this was unfolding for you so um fig was there um dan russell was there his wife was there um lots of friends um my folks were there uh you know it's you know all the guys, most of the guys from Fugitive, um, you know, I mean, talk to you. Um, you know, it sucks um, because, you know, it's not supposed to happen, right? Like, that's not how this is supposed to end. Like, I'm supposed to do 25, 30 years, and I got a beach somewhere that I'm going to, you know, drink a beer with fig on the beach in Puerto Rico or something like that. When we're retired, like that's, yeah. that that's what's supposed to happen. It's not supposed to, you know, we're supposed to go chase bad guys and promote and, you know, go do something else that that's, that's what we're supposed to do. It's not supposed to end like this. And these guys, you know, I let every one of them down. I let fig down, let you down, let you down. Um, because that's not supposed to happen. And I, I remember sitting there, you know, with Fig or Dan or getting people reaching out, like not feeling like I deserved that support because, you know, I mean, I, what, what's the worst thing I could do? At this, I mean, this is one of the worst things I could do. Um, you know, I violated, you know, their trust, my family's trust. Um, yeah, it was, it, it, I, I had lots of friends. Um, but I'll tell you, at the time, I really didn't feel like I deserved what they were, you know, the, the help and the love they were offering. If one of those friends had come to you and said, hey, you got a problem right now, you need to get some help, would you have listened to that or was were you at that point yet? I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. I would like to think that I would have, but again, you know, unfortunately we have this conversation with the benefit of hindsight, right? Nobody, including me had any idea how, how deep this went, how, how bad off things were, you know, drinking as a symptom is you know self-medicating it, it, it's it's not um it's not uh what's the word i'm looking for it's not the it, it, it's not the only thing it's it's just an example it's just a uh, an indicator of a bigger problem and it's not how much or how little you're drinking how often you're drinking it's why you're drinking it's not, it's not, you know, you can, you can drink once a week and be an alcoholic. It, it's not, you know, and you can drink every day and not be an alcoholic. It, it's, it's not that you're drinking, it's why you're drinking. And for me, you know, I was, I was, you know, seeking help for, you know, depression, possibly some anxiety, um, prior to this, prior to May 25th. Um, and the therapist that I was seeing was like, Oh, you, you might have some, some post-traumatic stress in there too. Um, you know, I knew something was wrong. I just didn't quite know what and how bad it was. And of course, unfortunately, you know, May 25th had to happen for me to kind of 
put that into perspective. And it wasn't even immediately after that. Like, it still took a little bit of time for me to kind of put those pieces together. You were seeing a therapist before this happened? Mm-hmm. Do you feel like that might have helped a little bit? Or do you expand cer- on that a little bit? It, it certainly didn't hurt. Um, you know, uh, Joe, I liked what you said. You know, finding the therapist is kind of like dating. You know, you, you might not click with one. Um, you know, the one I was seeing before was was fine. Um, you know, wasn't wasn't bad at what they were doing. Um, and just, I don't feel like they were, you know, that they, they were specialized for me. Like I was, I was something. I think that they probably weren't used to seeing, and they didn't. They didn't know what questions to ask, where to go with me. And that became, you know, I kept saying, oh, well, you know, I don't know that I feel any different, but, you know, give it time. You know, it, it's, it's not, even, even then I knew it, well, this doesn't change overnight. Like, you can't go to therapy, you can't, you can't, you know, take a pill and, okay, well, it's going to be, you know, you're fixed tomorrow. No, it doesn't work that way. Even I knew that. So. Why did you start going? Um, you know, when I, when I went back and I, uh, going back to what I said, when I'm, I said, told my wife, I said, I think I might have some depression. She goes, fucking duh. Um, I, I was like, okay, well, let me go start seeing somebody to, you know, see what they say. And they were like, okay, well, maybe you should try talking to your doctor about getting on an antidepressant. And I tried that. And, you know, again, we have these conversations with the benefit of hindsight, um, you know, I got put on a starter dose of an antidepressant. It just wasn't enough. You know, um, I didn't know if I was any better. Um, and I continued that kind of through in, and, and after May 25th. Um, and I remember, oh, when would it have been? Probably July. Um, you know, we were just in kind of holding pattern, you know, with, you know, the case and the profession and all that. And like I was still on administrative leave. Um, they hadn't, they hadn't even, I don't even think they'd gotten the blood work back yet. Um, and they, I was having a conversation with my wife one day and, um, I said, do you think I'm, I'm doing better you, you think this medicine's working? She looks at me. She goes, no. I was like, oh, ouch. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but, um, you know, I've learned over the course of my 21 years with her um, that, you know, <laughs> she'll tell me what I need to hear, not necessarily what I want to hear. And uh, I remember... I think I texted Dan. I was probably texting you, Fig, too, at the time. And I was like, I, you know, I don't, I don't think this is working, right? Like, I don't, I don't know. And again, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, I was probably getting worse um, because there was the added stress, right? Uh, added uncertainty. The added uncertainty. Um, and it just, it was getting, yeah, it was getting worse. Um, Can you talk about 3FTL and how that got going? So that's because of you. Um, I was texting with Dan one day and I get a, a text from him. It says, this is from Joe King. And there was a couple of different uh, services that were on there, but. 3FTL was the top one with kind of the recommendation of, hey, these guys really know what they're doing. <clears throat> and I remember the week before uh, my birthday, actually, um, I called and I texted uh, Jennifer over at 3FTL. And I talked to her on the phone and I was like, look, I don't I don't know what's going on. I, I, I know something's wrong at this point. I Obviously, we have we have new things that have uh, popped up that are good indicators that something is wrong. 
Um, but I, I don't know, maybe I have some PTS. <laughs> she kind of chuckled a little bit. And, uh, so there's no, no maybe to it. <laughs> she said, if you've worked in a urban environment like Dallas for more than six months, I guarantee you, you have some of it at, at, at least on some level. And, um, she scheduled a meeting for me on Monday. Uh, that next Monday I, I went in and saw her and, uh, she's, it was very interesting cause she is so just she like vibrates energy and to have that that kind of um that just that intense personality that she has be as calming as she is um you know i walk up and i'm and she's like hi i'm i'm jen and i go to shake her hand and she goes no i'm a hugger <laughs> i'm like oh okay we're doing this and i i thought i was there to kind of I didn't know what, what to expect. I thought I was there for like a consult and she was like, all right, this is what we're going to do. And she's like, we're going to do this. We're going to take your blood. We're going to, we're going to check all these things. Um, you know, I'm going to set you up with this counselor. I have a list of counselors that are phenomenal. We've had them all ourselves. And I'm like, Oh, so this is happening. And she goes, yeah, this is happening. And that uh, treadmill had been turned on. Oh yeah. It was going. Yep. So the hardest part was probably deciding, hey, I need to call these people, and everything else from there got real easy. Well, I wouldn't say easy. I mean, but the process of getting it, started. It, yeah, it, it was. There were a lot of things that um, she it, she would ask me questions about. You know, well, how how do you feel about this, or how's this? You know, how's your sleep? Is is this happening when you sleep? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, okay, and. And I was, she was like, I, I hear this all the time, you know, and that was kind of the, the, the big thing is, that I, I kind of realized was how lonely I, you know, I mean, you get isolated o literally overnight. I was isolated from every, virtually every friend I had. Your um, identity was taken. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very lonely. So even, I mean, I was in a house surrounded by my wife and children and I was completely alone and, um, it's not a good feeling. And Jen was very, very emphatic. Um, you know, there's these things you can go to these groups with other first responders. She goes, anybody you talk to is going to know what you're going through. This is the, like, you are not alone. And that was very um uh, it was really important i think it, it, i've been lucky in life of ending up in situations where i get what i need right when i need it you know and that was one of those situations where i kind of landed with three ftl right when i needed them um and i mean they were doing everything there everything was in house they were you know checking hormone levels it's where i learned about you know the the sort of cycle of how important sleep is how important not just sleep good sleep your hormone levels and how stress pts but not not just pts but stress in general what happens to your body when you're bathed when you're just constantly taking cortisol baths what that does to all your other hormone levels and how cyclical that becomes and the circle just gets tighter and tighter and like the snake eats its own tail because you're stressed and you're drinking. Well, that screws with your hormone levels, which get lower. So all that becomes, um, uh, your hormone levels get lower. Your, um, you start to feel bad. So you might drink a little more. You don't sleep. So you feel worse and everything is just it, it it it's never ending and the pressure just gets more and more until something finally breaks and i had no idea you know um what did you learn most about yourself wow <laughs> um that 
it it was like hunting bad guys. You got to have the right intel. You got to have the right training. Um, yeah, I mean, you might get lucky finding them once in a while, but it becomes a skill, right? You got to know what tactics to employ when. Um, so I defaulted to learning how to do that um, about, you know, the, the, the biggest thing, biggest takeaway for me was, you know, they, they, they were like, they said, your hormone levels are a little off. <laughs> and, uh, I remember calling Fig and telling him about it. And he asked what my levels were and I told him and he, his words were, bro, how did you get out of bed in the morning? And I said, it's kind of hard. Um, and it's, it's like puzzle pieces, right? You put one in there and that shows you the shape for the next one that you need to put in there. And so when I got hooked up with, um, my therapist, Renee, shout out to Renee. Um, and, uh, you know, Jen was telling me about it. She was like, I think she's going to be great for you. Um, I went in there and she told me that she specialized in something called EMDR. Um, and, uh, you know, for her, um, the more accurate was, uh, ART, which is, um, uh, accelerate, accelerated resolution therapy. And she was explaining it to me. And I think I had a look on my face like, is this for real? <laughs> like, is this, is this really going to work? Um, and I remember trying it. We'd done our, our, we did our first session, our first couple of sessions that we didn't do that. She kind of got to know me and, uh, know my story. Um, she took a lot of notes. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, she, the first session we did, I remember I got home and, um, I had the worst headache. I was like, Oh, is this what it's going to be like every time and I walked in the next time? She goes, no, it goes away after two or three. So about the third one, I didn't have them anymore, but about the third one, um, I started to notice that the, the ART coupled with, you know, appropriately adjusted meds being on, uh, hormone therapies, um, with all my levels getting, um, corrected. Now I'm sleeping, not having the nightmares anymore. Um, and I remember, I don't know if you remember it, but I remember calling you and going, bro, is this what normal feels like? Yeah, I remember that. I have, I was like, I haven't felt like this in a decade. Like, and I mean, obviously 10 years prior, it wasn't as bad, <clears throat> but I was, it, it, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know what I didn't know. And being, going down through that, through all that and, and learning uh, what the puzzle pieces are supposed to look like and how they fit together. I remember just <laughs> sitting, sitting there one time. I was probably the same conversation. I said, I wish I'd known this five years ago. It, so finding that, uh, that counselor with three FTL compared to who you were seeing before. Yeah. That, 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 that made a, that made a difference. It really did. Um, you know, and, and personality was like, I didn't get away with anything, <laughs> you know, which I guess is what I need. She read right I, through your bullshit. Oh yeah. Um, you know, it's almost like she knows what she's doing. Um, and so, uh, but she, she really knew, I mean, she really knew what she was doing. And I remember that she said the, the standard course of therapy for that's like up to 12. And she goes, but most people never need 12. Um, and we stopped doing the ART after seven, seven sessions. I was like, I, I, I had no idea that, that I could, that I felt as bad as I did, you know, looking back down the road, I'm just like shaking my head. Did you find it reassuring 
<clears throat> or otherwise that they can basically look at you and listen to what you say. And they're like, we've seen this before. So I found that very reassuring that it wasn't. And, and the fact that, you know, the people, whether it's Jen, whether it's Renee or, or, you know, some of the, some of the guys that when I would go to like a group session or something like that, and be, there'd be other first responders, which I found funny. I was always the only cop in there. Everybody else was firefighters. Um, but they could describe what I was feeling. They could, they could describe what I was, they could pretty much say what I was going to say. Like my next sentence, they already knew what I was going to say. Cause they've been there. Yeah. And that was a big, that was a big help. That was a big help. See, I have mixed emotions on it. I don't know if it's, if it's reassuring or if it's just kind of spooky to me. Like I'm like, eh, you know, maybe you haven't, maybe I don't know if I'm the weirdo and everybody else is normal or if we're all just kind of screwed up the same way. And so it's, my my son's reading a, a self help book right now on uh I really don't even know what it's all about. We've we've only gotten through a couple of chapters and he likes to talk about it, but I said, Do you feel like sometimes they're speaking directly to you? And is that weird to you? And he was like, It is a little bit weird, but he goes, It doesn't always it's not exactly how I feel and I was like, I know, but it's weird yeah. that, that somebody has experienced this enough to where they feel like they can write a book about it now. So you're you're not a weirdo because you feel this way. You're just like everybody else and that part kind of scares me too. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, our brains all function the same way, you know, um, the chemistry is the same. And it's like a watch with all the little moving parts and whether it's hormones or the, uh, cortisol adrenaline dumps, we all have more, some have more and some have less than others, but and it I, still is a machine. And I went, I know after seven, seven, um, Sergeant Nash told me he wanted me to go, talk to somebody and I went through ATO and saw, I, I don't remember who it was. Um, I saw somebody and, you know, I, I talked to him and we were there for about an hour and they said, you know, you sound, you sound pretty good. And at the time I probably was right. My brain was doing what it was supposed to do, right? It was taking that trauma and, and bearing it because I had to continue on. Um, you know, the analogy that I, I use is, you know, you got a, a chemical plant on, next to a river and they take a 55 gallon drum full of that toxic waste and they go bury it next to the river and they cover it up. What happens the next day? Nothing. What happens six months later? Maybe still nothing. What about two years later after the started to rust and the chemicals are eating away at it? And now all of a sudden those chemicals are leaching out into the water and everything's flowing downstream and poisons everything down from there. Um, you know, that it was too, too fresh. It was too, you know, that was within a month of seven, seven. Um, you know, what I went through was objectively traumatic. Um, but my brain hadn't processed it. It had just taken that toxic waste barrel and buried it down into the ground. And it was just sitting there. Waiting. Waiting. So we've just kind of gone through an entire life journey. Been born in Germany. Mm -hmm. Given up the very short-lived dream of being a stagehand prop setter. Mm -hmm. Having an exemplary police officer career to going through a life changing arrest in 2022. And like I said earlier that all these processes unfold at their own pace. They're not easy and they're not pretty for anybody, uh, especially administratively. And you get called to the headquarters for mm -hmm. a hearing mm -hmm. to uh, learn your fate. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Second longest day of my life. <laughs> um, You've had a lot of those. Yeah. Um, you know, I walked in there and, and Fig was there too. Uh, you're at a lot of those. Um, what can I say, man? I love you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's always hope that you're going to be the one that they want to hang their hat on 
but I, I, I knew what time it was. Like, there was just, you know, I'm 99% not mad at Chief Garcia for firing me, which is what happened. Um, you know, would I have liked to, to have, you know, would I have liked to have been that guy that they hang their hat on? Yeah, but at the end of the day, I'm not, I'm not special. Like I'm not that I'm not that special guy that that you know I'm I'm another cop that you know like I said I, I've spent an entire career holding people accountable for their actions you know what kind of an example am I if I'm not held accountable which is what needed to be done so um, Chief Garcia uh, you know to be fair he didn't seem to enjoy it. Um, but I can attest to that riding down the elevator with him after the hearing, uh, it took me aback of how, how hard he took it having to, to do that. And, you know, it, it, I always said I'd make a lousy chief. Um, I, I'm glad, you know, I, I like chief Garcia a lot. Um, you know, uh, he's been overall pretty phenomenal for this department um which was a long time coming um you know it sucks but as they say it is what it is you know there there wasn't a whole lot to be done about it um you know some of it's you know his hands were tied so well of all that comes out of this is that you now have more tools to help yourself and 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 make your your own machine work better than mm-hmm. it did before twenty twenty two. Oh yeah, because that's for you, your future, and for your family. Mm-hmm. So speaking on adjustments, I can tell you the department has made adjustments since since you were fired. Um, an alcohol policy has come out. Uh, we've had 12 officers go through that successfully. It's outstanding. Um, it's amazing. Uh, had two of those which promoted since going to rehab. And um, I can tell you when we were in discussions of coming out with this uh, alcohol policy, I brought your name up to to the chiefs. And I told them that we failed you as a department. We failed you, and we failed several other officers before you because, you know, uh, we go through a lot of shit in this career, man, and uh, and and we just didn't know how to how to deal with it, right? So now, um, you know, it's too late for all of you guys, right? But from now on, there there is something available, and uh, that's what we're here for. And I'm going to piggyback off that, too, as far as, yes, you, you're you a casualty of of this profession. And what you experience and what your friends and family have experienced, and they're still experiencing it. They're still going through this trauma with you. And your journey is not over. But I will say that sitting in this very room for a lot of the people that that we have talked in of the 12 that we have talked into and encouraged to go get help. It's rewarding, but then also it is, it really hurts to see one of our own get arrested. Mm -hmm. And we just come on the heels of two other uh, officers that were in the same situation you were in Mm -hmm. back in 2022. And if, if they can take anything away from, from, your life experience, your professional experience, and what you went through from just the trauma alone into the to the drinking to cope into your your arrest. I, I want them to realize that they're not alone. And every time that you you go out and you drive, or you don't, or you ignore the warning flags, the red flags that are waving in front of you you're really rolling the dice on your life and your career. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, 
it's uh, can confirm not worth it. I have a final question. Now, and you, you've referred to speaking on from hindsight uh, for the last two hours, mm-hmm. and it is very, very valuable to have that. What would 2024 Daniel Jameson tell 2022 Detective Jameson? From the day you start the academy, uh, and every FTO you have, every partner you have, every Instagram page that you follow, they always talk about listening to your listening to your gut, right? When the hair on the back of your neck stands up, it stands up for a reason. For me, I knew I could tell something was wrong. I didn't know what, but I needed to. Yeah, I I ignored the hair on the back of my neck. Some of that is no. I, I, I'm good. I got this. Well, if you say I got this, you don't got it. If you think something is wrong, it's probably wrong. I mean, they tell you that all the time here. If you think if you think something's about to go down, it probably is. You know, when when your brain is literally screaming at you, listen to it. And yeah, it gets heavy, and it's not easy. But nothing worth it ever is. It is a um, painful journey staring the trauma in the face looking at it but at the end you know for me the EMDR worked great it doesn't necessarily work for everybody it's not the only treatment it's not the only therapy there's there's plenty of other things that are out there but do something stop just don't sit on your ass like listen to your body even even as a preventative start talking to somebody I mean, the, the things, there could be things bothering you that you don't even realize are bothering you. And take care of yourself because a lot of people don't. And, you know, the frog in the boiling pot of water is very real. Sometimes, for me, it, it, it I came to the realization too late. Um, you know, if somebody can listen to this podcast, if somebody can listen to this and go, well, that sounds like me. Oh, man. Um, then I think it'll be worth it. Just because I'm not a cop anymore doesn't mean I'm not a cop anymore. Hey, brother, hey, sister, I'll never give up on you. Hey, Mrs., hey, mister, I'll see this all the way through. sun and the moon I'll never give up on you Down when you're lonely I'll pull you up Life leaves you heavy when the going gets tough I'll be your shoulder Together we'll run up from the bottom Hey brother, hey sister, I'll never give up on you Hey Mrs. Hey mister, I'll see this all the way through No matter how far the sun is See this all the way through 
No matter how far for the gold and the blue, I'll never give up.